from now. So welcome to every to everybody who's joined today. I'm really grateful to have you join. These are monthly webinars, usually once a month. This month it'll be um, two times this month that um, we're very pleased to, to offer through the Happiness Initiative. Today we have Diana Dunbar, who is a licensed therapist and mindfulness coach, um, has been working for about 20 years in this field and has found that mindfulness really is a wonderful gift towards a happier, a happier state in, in psychological well-being. Um, on next week, on Tuesday, we'll, we will have um, some women talking from Vermont, where, like Maryland, it's one of the only states that has adopted the genuine progress indicator in lieu of just genuine um, gross domestic product to, to guide their state. Um, so we're very excited about that. There they're using the Genuine Progress Indicator as well as the Gross National Happiness Index. These talks were inspired from a conference that was held at the United Nations last year in April, where the government of Bhutan and the Secretary General of the United Nations brought together academics, politicians, and nonprofits from around the world um, to, with the the mission of launching a global happiness and well being movement, and we were very very pleased to be able to attend that conference and to be part of the working group. We've been doing this work around gross national happiness and the happiness and well being movement for a little over three years now. Um, our organization is called the Happiness Initiative, which you can locate online at happycounts.org. So that's in, ter in, other, in, in terms of your happiness counts. So happycounts.org, where you can learn about other webinars that we're doing. Um, you can give us feedback on these webinars, and you can also take the Gross National Happiness Index and get an idea of your own personal well-being. So that's a little bit about um, what these talks are, where we come from, um, who we are, and and now I'm going to talk a little bit about the logistics for our talk today, and then I'll be handing it over to Diana, who will talk for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll do question and answer. So regarding that question and answer logistics, you see on your screen, you should see a little control panel, and there you can ask questions. So there's two ways you can ask a question. You can raise your hand, um, and if you have a headset, I encourage you to do that, because that way I can open it up and you can ask that question verbally, which is nice to hear your voice. The other way that you can ask a question is you can type it into the question box. If you have a question during her talk, Diana's talk, please just go ahead and, and type that question and I'll field those for you um, and for Diana as we're going along. And if you have, when you have a question and answer part afterwards, please raise your hand. Typically what happens in the question and answer period is it takes people a little while to ask questions. So I end up asking the first few questions. And then when we get to the end of, a, of the, our time, a bunch of people have questions to ask. So I really encourage you to, um, to raise your hand or to ask your questions early in the Q&A part. So it's not just me talking. Um, this is really about interaction. Um, our last talk um, was with uh, John um, de Graaf. And one of the things that I love that happened in the Q&A part is um, there was some interaction. So people were giving more information. And that is part of the point of these talks is that we share and we learn. So la the last piece of the logistics is these talks, um, these webinars are recorded. You can you will be able to access this recording and uh, recordings of the other webinars that we've given through Basecamp. And the way that you do that is just you just shoot me an email and I will give you access to Basecamp. And I'm going to put my email up um, on the question and answer part so you'll have you'll have uh, access to my email as well as our the URL for the Happy Counts website, the Happiness Initiatives website. So now I'm going to turn it over to Diana. Um, Diana, thank you so much for giving this talk, and we're really looking forward to hearing about mindfulness for a happy life. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. And I'm very excited to talk about what my experience has been uh, as a psychotherapist and as a mindfulness coach in the last uh, nearly 20 years. And uh, so I wanted to go ahead and talk to you about what I know about mindfulness and happiness. So the name of my company is Mindful Experience. And what I've found through the years is that I'm able to help people achieve results through just one thing, awareness. 
And from my study and practice of mindfulness, it became really clear that the more I can help my clients become aware, the more uh, powerful they can become in their life, and the more results they'll have in the areas that they're looking for results. So, show you here. Getting to the next slide. There we go. Um, so basically the mission of Mindful Experience is to provide dynamic and engaging mindfulness and cognitive behavioral coaching that transforms participants and creates transformation in the workplace, community, and home. And that is what my, my organization is about. And this is a part one of a two-part webinar which will continue in two weeks, two weeks from today. So our agenda for today is I'm going to define mindfulness and then talk about how mindfulness and happiness play and how to use mindfulness in your daily life. And then we're going to play around with a little bit of mindfulness and then I'm going to give you some things to, to do at home. And I look forward to join you joining me in two weeks. So what is mindfulness? We've been, this term has become more and more popular. And this is a really good de definition that my teacher, John Kabat-Zinn, um, taught me. And uh, it's very simple. Paying attention on purpose, moment-to-moment -moment awareness. And what I've been teaching now for about 16 years is mindfulness meditation. And so meditation, most of you may know, is a practice of concentrated focus upon a sound, an object, upon a visualization, uh, upon the breath, movement, or attention itself. And we're going to practice breath awareness today. So what, what we do know is the brain changes in, in mindfulness meditation and it results in an increased capacity for our memory, a, a increased capacity for learning, for uh, an ability to have a stronger, healthier sense of self, a more embodied sense of self. Uh, we also know that our brain changes in a way that allows us to be empathic sharing empathy for others. It also, uh, we also find out here that it also increases self-awareness and introspection and compassion. So this is where that intersection of happiness and mindfulness meet in my mind. As I'm watching and observing and seeing the real life changes of my clients as their memories changing, their ability to learn is improving, their ability to have a stronger more embodied sense of themselves, more connected sense of themselves, and more empathy, as well as the self-awareness and compassion, people are reporting a much happier life, a much more content existence on the earth, and it's quite exciting to see those changes. We also know from, you'll see the research is cited at the bottom of each slide, that with mindfulness, we also have we've shown that you can turn down the volume on destructive emotions and turn down the volume on our fear center, the fear center of our brain, which is the amygdala. That's where our traumas are stored and where our body goes into what we're all familiar with as fight or flight. So we, we know that when we label our emotions, it turns down this alarm center that triggers the negative emotions. So as we're practicing, practicing mindfulness meditation, we're noticing our emotions, we're noticing our thoughts, our feelings, our sensations. And as we're noticing them and being the curious observer, we're able to label them. And as we're labeling them, we're, we're dampening down our amygdala. We're calming our amygdala. And as we practice this on the cushion, as we say, or in our chair, <clears throat> or in a comfortable place in our home, we're then able to take and practice it every day, build that muscle. We're able to take it out into the real world, into our lives, 
<clears throat> excuse me, with our partners, with our coworkers, with our children, with our community at large, and we're able to come from a place of being responsive and less reactive. And that is quite exciting. And that is changing the quality of our life and increasing our ability to get out of a place of fight or flight where I like to say the aperture of the lens is very, very small and narrow and the focus is very narrow, which is what happens to our body when we're in fight or flight. So we're able to open very slowly the aperture of the lens and see 180 and then see 360 and see all of the world that's available to us and all of the things that are available to us and get uh, allow our bodies to get into a more responsive mode so that we can come from a place of calm, peace and center and homeostasis and move from that place as we move through our lives. And what we do know about the brain is people are not just stuck at their respective set points. So a lot of people, you know, say to me, well, you know, I've been doing this for years, 20, 30, 40, 50. Um, I have family members in their 60s, 70s, and 80s saying, oh, I've been doing this for so long. How, you know, how am I supposed to all of a sudden change to be a, a, a less reactive person? There are certain things that just trigger me. You know, I, I don't think I can change that. Well, we know, and I know that most of you have been hearing more and more about the neuroplasticity of our brains, and it's becoming more and more um, prevalent information. A lot of studies have been done at many places. Uh, University of Wisconsin is a place that uh, Richie Davidson, who's extremely well known, has been doing a lot of um, evidence-based research to show that uh, we can take advantage of our, planes, uh, of our brain's plasticity and train it to enhance these qualities. So it's quite exciting. And the other thing that I find really exciting is that this is not something that you need to go and be on retreat for years and years, or you need to practice for months and months. We're even finding that in one study that uh, people are making changes in five hours of meditation, 30 minutes uh, a day for a cumulative of five hours, people are finding changes in their brain which is causing them to come from a place of perceiving things with a more positive approach as opposed to a more trained, what we can train unconsciously as a negative way of seeing our lives. So it, in a short period of time, and I've seen it so many times in my practice of working individually with people and working in groups that in the second and even third week of an eight-week program that I teach, people are reporting significant changes and I'm seeing the significant changes on their face, expressed in their life, expressed in their relationships, expressed in the what we call in my business the presenting problems, the areas that they come to me for whether they're work stress, um, difficulty sleeping, um, angry episodes that are causing problems in relationships, um, physical pain, anxiety, uh, depression, dysphoric mood. So it's, it's quite exciting. So I want to make sure that everyone knows this is a this is not something that requires months and months, but can actually, you can start practicing today and start seeing results by the end of this week, which is quite exciting. And I strongly encourage you to go ahead and uh, start practicing so that we can talk about this in two weeks. So let's go ahead and practice breath awareness. It's one of my favorite pictures here, these adorable children doing what we've all done, practicing, practicing uh, using our breath out in the gorgeous nature. So let's go ahead and take a moment here right now and practice breath awareness. And I'd like for you to go ahead and notice the inhalation, that millisecond pause, and the exhalation. So make sure that you're in a comfortable place 
your feet are on the ground. You're feeling your body. Feeling the back as it rests against wherever you're sitting. Feeling the backs of your legs wherever you're resting. Feeling your hips. Noticing your feet. And just beginning to gently take a moment now to notice your breath. Notice where it's coming from. I mean, excuse me, notice where it's most prominent. Notice if it's prominent for you in your belly or if it's prominent in your chest. So bring your awareness to this area and begin. You may want to even put your hand on your belly or your hand on your chest to notice the rise and the fall of your breath in your body. So let's go ahead and practice breath awareness. And what I'd like for you to do now that you're really present in your body, or more present than you were two minutes ago, begin to feel your inhalation and notice it and follow it all the way to where it arrives at that pause, that millisecond pause that exists right before, and you'll feel it and notice it, your exhalation. So let's notice, gentle, you're not forcing your breath, you're allowing your breath to be very natural. Let's notice the inhalation, the pause, and the exhalation for the next seven breaths. So I'll allow you to, the time to do that. So now that you've practiced breath awareness, just take a moment to notice what's happening with your thoughts. Notice without any judgment and with complete patience and acceptance, what happened to your thoughts? Did they slow down? Did they speed up? Did the quality of your thoughts change? And just answer that question to yourself. Maybe write it down, write the answer if you want. And then tell me what you noticed in terms of your emotions as you were practicing this breath awareness. Did you notice your emotions change in any way? Did they increase or decrease in intensity? Did your emotion completely change to another emotion? So from maybe sadness to peace or from peace to contentment or joy. So just be aware there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just asking you to be curious and to track what is happening it, it, to the best of your recollection. And then if you could make note right now in this moment of what you noticed in terms of your body, how it feels now versus how it felt at the beginning of practicing our breath awareness. If you noticed any changes in maybe particular areas where you might hold constriction or tightness. So it could be your shoulders, could be your jaw, could be your back. So noticing overall changes and again, there's no right or wrong answer. We're just noticing what is in the last two minutes practicing breath awareness. 
So I, I would like to stop right here and ask if there are any questions and invite you to either type your questions, which I can see, or you could come in and Laura will let you come in and, and ask a question or two because I want to capture this in the moment as best as we can to, to know what people's experience was like. So we have one question from Denise Layton who asks, um, does this work for people in the autism spectrum? You know, I, would, I don't have personal experience with that. I think that's a really good question, Denise. Um, but I have worked with actually two parents um, that have worked with their children. So I haven't worked with the children directly and I, and I haven't worked with an adult. But I've worked with parents that do practice this with their children and they do say that their children feel calmer and feel it more, more at peace and are able, able to de-escalate when the child becomes um, escalate, have some form of escalation with maybe anger or tearfulness. So that's the best I can answer the question because I've not had direct experience only via adults I've worked with as they've worked with their children. Okay. Um, and then Denise has a follow-up question, which you may have already answered, but what about um, schizophrenia and, and anxiety coupled with somebody on the spectrum? Um, would there be any modifications that you would suggest around mindfulness for somebody with on the autism spectrum with schizophrenia and anxiety? Hmm. Well, because I, uh, again, haven't directly worked with um, autistic clients, I would say that to simplify the exercise is really important and to practice, uh, especially anxiety, to practice, to use this practicing walking meditation can be very powerful. Three steps in one direction, three or four steps, and then having the client turn around and do another three steps in another direction could be very powerful. Very short distances, walking back and forth, three or four or five, depending on how much room um, can be very powerful to manage anxiety. Um, and so I can say that very, uh, with, with pretty strong certainty in working with anxiety patients and anxiety clients. Great, thank you. And then we have a question from um, Jay Beal. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, do you have recommendations on free meditation groups? I'm particularly interested in finding one where I can feel safe that no one will try to convert me to a religion. Oh gosh, there um, are many and uh, fr free meditation groups online, I've noticed, and I would be more than happy um, if you would send me an email, Diana, D-I-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, at mindfulexperience.com, to send you probably at least four or five um, links to free meditation groups um, that are non-denominational and um, uh, interested in you practicing meditation, not becoming a Buddhist or any other um, form of religion. So I would be uh, thrilled to hook you up with those organizations. And you said your name, her name is uh, Jay oh, Beal? Yeah, we'll put, you, we'll put your um, contact information out shortly. Yes. Okay, and then we have another question um, from Denise Moore again. Um, would you define how would you define negative, quote-unquote, negative emotions, which seem to apply some relative value judgment? How would I define negative emotions? Mm -hmm. Right, which seem to imply a, a relative value judgment. Hmm. Um, I... I don't find that emotions are either negative or positive, um, and I find that destructive actually. Um, I think that if we can um, take away the value judgment by saying this is what I'm having, this is an emotion that I'm having, and, and labeling it as just simply an emotion, neither good nor bad, right or wrong. And that is the essence of practicing mindfulness meditation is to find the middle ground and to find the, the non-judgment, the non-judgmental place that exists inside of all of us. So um, when someone comes to me saying, 
I'm negative or I am focused on having a lot of negativity, I would uh, strongly encourage them to experience uh, whatever they're experiencing um, as um, in, in an accepting way using the mindfulness practice and to let go of a label of it being negative. And hopefully um, that's helping you, Denise, in um, answering the okay. question. If not, please. Yeah, she just uh, um, let me know. I don't know if we're pronouncing the names right, but it, it did note that, that um, the fight or flight was used and a negative emotion was used to describe that. So. Um, oh, well, so, thank you. I, yeah. will, uh, I will be more aware of that when I. Uh, <laughs> present and watch my language more closely, but uh, yes, I appreciate you bringing that to my attention. And I just want to note here that um, I've been doing this work on sustainability and happiness and sort of world changing, and that public learning is a big um, key identifier of, of whether or not we are being true to, true to who and what we are in, in creating a new paradigm. So, so thank you for that public learning, um, Denise and, and Diana. Um, so we have another question from um, from William Nelson. Should you have a goal in mind or just let it happen? Um, I would say not having a goal in mind is ideal. The, uh, the, the goal, if there is such a quote-unquote goal, would be to allow what is to be. So, and not having a goal, except just being open and spacious up to be as it is and then to come back to your breath as using your breath as an anchor. So that's the closest to a goal I would say that would be helpful. Okay, and William, if you would just let us know if, um, if you had more follow-up or if that you felt like that was a, um, a good enough answer. All right, and then Krista is asking, what would you suggest to someone who often falls asleep when practicing meditation? Well, um, in my training in meditation, when we fall asleep, uh, I've been trained to deal with it in two different ways. And um, depending on the person that I'm working with and their um, issues, so I have a lot of clients with chronic illness and chronic pain. And I ask them to really closely monitor where they are um, with their pain and their illness. And it might be uh, an indicator when they're falling asleep that it would be really powerful for them to take that as a message and to go ahead and relax and allow themselves to take a nap or fall asleep and then come back to the meditation because the mindfulness meditation is about falling awake to what is. Um, and then and to use their best judgment and discernment and to know that sometimes um, falling asleep is a way of, in some cases, us really wanting to distract ourselves from what we're needing to pay attention to um, and when you can discern that that is the case that you might want to do something like if you are lying down and doing a, a lying down meditation that you would sit up and if sitting up is not uh, and rolling your shoulders back and refreshing your posture is not helpful in bringing you to a place of wakefulness then I would say standing up and trying, um, which is what we do often on retreat, uh, is can be very powerful to bring yourself to falling awake to what's happening inside of your body and in your mind and in your emotions. So hopefully that answered the question, Krista. So I think um, that's all the questions we have for right now. Did you want to continue with your presentation? or? Sure, okay, sure. Great. So when we, pray, when we play with mindfulness at home, uh, some of the things that I have people do is practice informal meditations daily, picking a few things, washing dishes, putting, placing the key in the door, um, can be very, very powerful. And I find that when I can uh, ask people to... Um, to, to take one or two things that they regularly do every day and make it into a moment-to-moment -moment awareness activity, uh, they find it 
super powerful in bringing in, in making uh, mindfulness alive and well in their life. So, so choosing an everyday activity, folding clothes, reading a, a book to your child, um, watering your plants, um, even washing the clothes, taking the shower, all of these things can then be extraordinarily powerful to add up in what I call the well of awareness. So you can drop a, a few drops every day or even a um, cup full every day depending on how often you practice these informal meditations. So we might try, um, let's say, eating a meal the first, even the first two minutes of a meal with mindful awareness or again washing the dishes or putting the key in the door with mindful awareness watch, watching your um, reactions to these particular everyday activities and we find that by the end of the week you're well from which to draw from that you'll have later maybe during the week when you might have a stressful situation occur something at work or something in the traffic on the highways, um, you'll have that well in which to draw from because you've been making daily deposits. So it's a really uh, powerful way to make daily deposits into the mindfulness well so that when we're under stress and pressure, we can uh, practice. So picking maybe two things every day and practice that for two or three days and then you can try another two activities, really powerful. And then the breath awareness we just practiced, practicing that every morning and every night before you go to sleep can be extraordinarily powerful. Um, so, and that could take as much as uh, a minute uh, or five minutes or as little as 30 seconds. And what it does is it grounds you, brings you into present moment awareness and allows you to uh, start your day with, okay, I'm here, I'm present. I'm, and then to bring that type of intention and awareness and presence, um, it sets the tone for the rest of the day. I'll have clients tell me when I'm not practicing my morning meditation, and again, it can be five or 10 minutes of breath awareness, or it could be a 30 minute sitting meditation people tell me that they notice quite quickly by even, uh, people tell me even by mid-morning, how distracted they become or how reactive they become just from not practicing. Uh, so this definitely requires discipline and this is not, uh, you know, mindfulness is not about getting to an ecstatic state. It's about being present with where you are and learning to be less reactive and experience peace uh, and acceptance and non-judgmental um, uh, awareness with yourself and of course as we practice this with ourselves then our relationships change um, with others and we become much more powerful and much more um, compassionate and kind to one another and therefore our happiness changes because we're more connected to one another and of course starting with more connected to ourselves. So I really recommend that you play with mindfulness at home. There is a homework sheet that I've got uh, that Laura will post and I'd really love to see you guys practice over the next two weeks. I know we're all very busy and that's why I'm recommending that we start with things that we're already doing and with using our breath awareness. So um, I would love to open it up to questions and invite you guys to, to please uh, go ahead and um, ask me any questions and um. talk to me. Great. So if you want to go ahead and leave the, the main slide up, that would be great. So we can see that. Perfect. Um, so we have, um, we have a question from 
William Bear, and then I actually have a question after that, but if people would like to ask more questions, that would be wonderful. So um, William Bear asks, adverse childhood experiences impact a large number of people. How can this meditation change the brain of the adult who has these experiences? That's, uh, yes, William, definitely uh, find most of my clients have had very difficult childhood experiences, and we do know through the, uh, the uh, research that I was talking about earlier that our brains are quite uh, agile and quite malleable. And we're, we notice that within even five hours of training that the, the left prefrontal cortex can become more prominent. What we know about the left prefrontal cortex is that it is the part of our brain that allows us to feel pleasure and to feel good and it also allows us to uh, perceive things in a more positive view so and most of us kind of you know when, when we get in uh, when we have negative childhood experiences or difficult childhood experiences or challenges in our childhood that might set the tone for the way that react that we react to our lives um, that with practice, with mindfulness practice on a regular basis, we can start to change our brain where it's not so tilted to the right prefrontal cortex, but more to the left, so that we can start to have a screen, a positive screen through which we see our lives and see experiences so that they're not so um, intensely painful and we come from a place of presence instead of our uh, our framework from our childhood. Just hopefully that makes sense to you, William. And I do encourage people to get online and to ask questions live. I'd love to hear, uh, have a back and forth live if you'd like. Okay. And all you need to do is just raise your hand to do that if you have a headset um, that works out well usually. If you don't, then it, we often will get feedback. Um, so my question for you, Diana, is... Um, Oftentimes, I've noticed personally, and um, my Dharma teacher talks about how once you start a mindfulness practice, um, oftentimes instead of having a sense of, of peacefulness or getting to peace, as you said, um, uh, you get to a, a, a sort of a overwhelming ness it's like all of a sudden all of the things and the feelings and the thoughts that we've been managing through um you know television or drinking or or conflict um they all come up um and and that can be sort of a disincentive it seems to me for a mindfulness mm -hmm. practice so we could mm -hmm. address that yes absolutely I think um, anyone on this call uh, can attest to that, myself included, that at the beginning it um, definitely is overwhelming. And so I definitely want to normalize your experience with that, you, Laura, and anyone else. Um, and so I think taking it, taking the practice in small doses is very powerful. I think when we start to look at what we've been um, unconsciously and sometimes consciously putting aside, putting underneath, uh, let's say, put underneath the, the rug, shoving underneath the rug through, like you said, through maybe media, TV, or drinking, or shopping, or any of the addictions that we can um, allow ourselves to have, computer uh, game watching, that we feel this onslaught of all, all of our emotions that we've been hiding from. Uh, kind of flood us. So I would say um, to take it in small bites, to practice, uh, to take breaks. So I don't recommend um, you at a, as a beginner to sit with a lot of intensity for a long duration of time. I recommend that if the intensity comes up, that you're present to it, that you, if you can, notice what thought or emotion or experience or memory triggered it and then if you can yourself back to your breath and to the sensation of sitting and feeling your body and grounding yourself by feeling your feet on the ground and feeling your body where you're sitting and then resume practicing and if you feel again uh, too much intensity I would ask you to, 
to maybe to, to, to take a sip of water, to maybe do a walking meditation, and then to come back to But it is extraordinarily normal to feel. I'm not here, you are. I thought. Right. Um, so, can you hear me now? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, uh, um, that was my IT there. Yeah, that, I so, um, Dennis said, could you speak to how to apply mindfulness thinking more as a prophylaxis than a curative? That is, as one moves through each day. Did you um, did you get practicing? Yes, okay. yes. Pra okay. Practicing that. Yeah, I'm just taking a moment to okay. to think of the the question. So, practicing it daily, to and not being curative, I think is uh, very powerful. Um, and practicing it again using uh, simple everyday uh, mindfulness meditations or mindfulness moments through. Uh, Again, watering your plants or breath awareness as you do something pleasant like drink a cup of water, drink a, 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 some tea or serve your family dinner or serve yourself dinner uh, can be really um, powerful to bring yourself to what is and to open what I have people report to me is when they're practicing every day not trying to cure anything but as a way to maybe prevent anything from happening or prevent um, anything uh, negative from occurring, which of course we can't <laughs> prevent that kind of thing, but we can increase our stress hardiness by practicing mindfulness meditation. Um, I have people report to me, wow, you know, I step outside now and I notice the flowers that I wasn't noticing last week. Or I walk into the room and I see my daughter in a different way than I did before and enjoy her company in a much richer uh, loving way and I'm able to take in the love that she's been giving me all along and then I haven't been able to see so those are the kinds of things that people are um, reporting to me when they're practicing moment-to-moment -moment awareness with things every day they're just noticing brighter colors more richer experiences in their life. Great. So you um, Is that let, helpful, Dennis? Um, so I'm, I'm just going to follow up here. You led us through a, a breath meditation to give an example of how to apply mindfulness um, through the breath, but then spoke to um, to using mindfulness for a daily task. Could I think it might be worthwhile if you just take us through a, fo a few minutes of what that would look like, mindfulness of a daily task. Okay. So perhaps pretending that you're brushing your teeth or whatever it is that you do um, to be mindful for that day. That okay. Task. Fantastic. Okay. One of the things that um, I enjoy doing is basically making a cup of tea in the morning. And so I will turn on very slowly the burner and slow everything down and be exquisitely present to my hand as it turns on the burner putting the tea kettle on, putting the top of the tea kettle after I've filled it on. I usually fill it the night before, so. Um, and then I just put the top on, and I actually will stand there because I have a small amount of water and wait until I hear the very subtle whistle. And then I will take my, uh, my tea bag, tear it open, very slowly with moment-to-moment -moment awareness. If I become distracted by thought or a feeling or a physical sensation, I simply bring my awareness back to, in this, in this case, holding the tea bag, and then I 
basically take it, put it in the cup, and then again with present moment, moment to moment awareness, I pick up after the, the tea kettle's gone off to let me know it's whistled, I turn off the stove, and then I pick up the, the tea kettle, open the tea kettle with my thumb, and then I'm very slowly pouring the water in. And then I'm setting the tea kettle back down. And I let and I will actually sit at the table for two minutes. That's how long I like for my um, tea to brew. Walk over to the table, put the cup down. Slowly as we this walking meditation, as I've practiced it many times before, just slowly with awareness walk, sit down at the table and practice sitting in breath awareness for two minutes and then I'll pick up the cup and take a sip of my tea notice what it feels like to bring the cup to my lips notice what it feels like for the water to hit my tongue and then feel the water as it goes down my throat down the back of my throat and practice being as present and as aware as possible of the sensation of drinking the tea, of holding the cup, putting the cup down, and sitting with awareness, noticing how the effects of the water and the tea happen to change my body and change the warmth of my body in that moment. So that is a, a practice I have that I really enjoy. Another practice is I notice that sometimes when I'm uh, in a hurry to go somewhere, I'll say, you know what, if I can slow down in this moment and just take the key and put it in the car door to unlock the corridor or to these days to, because um, I have an older car, <laughs> um, to unlock the, the ignition or to open the ignition, a lot of us are clicking the car unlocked. So putting it in the ignition and turning the ignition and taking a moment again, it's 10 seconds to feel what it's, to slow myself down and to feel what it's like to be present in my car. And then I'll feel my feet on the pedals, feel my body sit in the car, feel my back, backs of my legs and my body as I sit in the car and have turned the key. And that's a way to slow me down so that I'm not, rushing off and then to set the tone for the drive and to set the tone I think it, it, it's it sounds so simple and it is so simple but it really sets the tone to add genuine awareness presence and calmness to what you're about to move into especially if you're in a hurry or um, having that speedy state of mind that we can all find ourselves easily pulled to Thank you. So William has yeah. an, another question. Um, how does mindful meditation change the executive function of the brain? Any reference to research? Yes. Um, I think, let me go back to... You'll notice here on David Cresswell's um, work here at the Center for Psychoneuroimmunology um, at the UCLA study, there's some information there. And then also in Psychiatry Research Neuroimaging, Neuroimaging 2011 study here, um, uh, where a lot of these researchers who I know, James Carmody here, um, who's at University of Massachusetts Center for Mindfulness, did a study to, to talk about the, the, uh, the brain changes, which enhances our um, neocortex. And again, as I was talking about earlier, uh, dampens down our amygdala. So our executive functioning, which is, resides in our neocortex, our higher brain, our memory is changed, our ability to, to um, have an enhanced memory, and our ability to learn, and our ability to focus um, a great place for uh, some fantastic research on focus 
and ADD and ADHD is the MARC Mindful Awareness Research Center at UCLA. I uh, recommend that you go to the MARC Center. I also have a number of people be happy to send you, Will, Will, uh, William, if you'd like to send me an email. I have uh, copies of papers that can uh, speak to this, uh, one by Richie Davidson that he wrote uh, recently. Um, and then you can access these two papers that I just rec uh, showed on the files. And then like Laura said, you will have the ability to get to um, this PowerPoint with these uh, citations. Great, thank you. Um, I want to add a mention that we have, uh, we give these webinars monthly, um, and last year we had a professor, Alexandra um, Alejandro at Antioch University, who did give a talk specifically around some of the research and science of, of happiness. So um, if you don't have access to Basecamp, just let me know, Laura, at happycounts.org, and, and we'll get you access so that you can download and, and listen to those other, other talks. Um, so Dennis asks the question, your description does not seem to include any externalities um, that do intrude on our awareness. How do you bring mindfulness to that experience? So I think I need to understand the question a little bit more. You're saying mm -hmm. that what, what we've spoken about doesn't um, touch on the external. So like what, what happens what, what, when what it pinches on us? Yeah. So what happens when you're, you know, you're having your cup of tea, and all of a sudden the kids are are yelling at you, or your partner is asking you to do something, or to give her mm -hmm. or him attention, or. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so through through uh, regular meditation practice, we find that people are a lot less reactive when. For instance, I'm in the middle of drinking my tea and my partner runs in and says, hey, you know, I need you to do this right now. I'm in a huge hurry instead of what I would do having not practiced mindfulness meditation. What I would have done formally without practice is reactivity saying, leave me alone. How rude. Look at you. Don't you notice I'm sitting here trying to you know, enjoy tea and with practice. I'm going to be much more um, able to answer in a more respectful, thoughtful um, tone that is more based on uh, in, in loving kindness, which would be just a just a minute, uh, honey. I need to uh, focus on this for just one more minute. Would that be okay? And getting his or her permission, and saying yes, I need no, I need it now, and I will be able to say okay and be able to respond in a more thoughtful kind way as opposed to a reactive, harsh, um, discompassionate way. So, so it changes our reactions when all sorts of stressful things happen to us. For instance, I was in a car accident a few years ago. It was a very minor thing. Somebody just bumped me from behind. They um, didn't, I didn't, or was it hurt, but they smashed my bumper. And I got out of the car and I looked at the lady and I said, are you okay? She said, fine, and she said, I, and she was just screaming and yelling and saying, I'm so sorry, I can't believe I did this, I was looking at pictures, please forgive me, and she said, why are you so calm? And I said, well, you know, you, you didn't hurt me, you, you look like you're not hurt, and my bumper's hurt and everything's fine, and I thought to myself after I drove away, wow, I'm not sure I would have done that five years ago had I not been practicing, and this, was, this happened, you know, about eight years ago. And I thought to myself, wow, this has really changed my life. I'm in this very stressful situation. I'm in traffic. This woman rams my bumper. I have a meeting to go to. And my reaction is much more thoughtful and much more, I was fortunate. I'm not always that way, I'll admit. But I was much more able to be compassionate and kind and, and uh, thoughtful about what was happening in the moment um, and, and less reactive. So that's what that's what it does. Um, it allows you, and this was the question from Denise. Is that right? I'm from Dennis. Yeah, from, from, from Dennis. Um, so that's that's what happens. Is that it allows you to to be in a much more thoughtful uh, response as opposed to a less reactive way of being. Okay, thank so you. So you're hurting yourself and 
damaging relationships. Beautiful. So I think we have time for maybe one more question, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, if anybody had any other questions? So I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping up a little bit. We do record these talks. These are monthly talks. Um, but this month we'll have two. Um, and our next one is going to be on next Tuesday, which will be um, a talk on what's happening at a policy level as well as an individual level in Vermont, where they were the second. They are now the second state government to adopt the genuine progress indicator, in lieu of just gross domestic product or gross state product. I guess one could say to guide their policymakers. Um, these talks are given by the Happiness Initiative. We are a national but very small nonprofit that offers the Gross National Happiness Index to anybody at any scale. So you can take it yourself to measure your own well-being along what Bhutan has identified as the domains of happiness, Bhutan being the country that is leading the world in the happiness movement and replacing or superseding genuine, um, or, sorry, uh, gross domestic product with gross national happiness. We're a, a grassroots project. We're very grassroots. Um, we encourage people to use the gross na national happiness index individually and um, for any size group that they would like to use that for. So whether that's a team or a family or a community, um, we have cities using it, we have ca campuses using it, um, we even have people using it at a family level, and we have businesses using this for um, interventions for employees. So we are eager to have you use it. If you can find a way to use it, you can go to happycounts.org and you can see how to conduct a happiness initiative and also take the survey itself. Um, this is a volunteer organization, and um, we, we will continue to offer these webinars as long as we can afford to do that. We appreciate any kind of donation. As a matter of fact, we need donations to keep these going. And you can donate at happycounts.org, and you'll see the donate button up at the top. So once again, these talks are recorded. You can get a recording of these and other talks. And we have some wonderful other talks, including one, one of my favorites, which is um, looking more at the policy piece from John Hall at the United Nations, um, who works with the Millennium Development Goals and used to work for the OECD Better Life Index, where he talks more about the, the policy piece and, and the, what is the role of government. Um, I just love that talk. You can download that one as well as this is a beautiful talk around um, individual happiness. One last word in Bhutan, they deeply understand that individual happiness is linked to, to policy where they are using gross national happiness to guide their policy decisions and their allocation of resources. But they speak to that link between individual happiness and a national happiness um, as we do in our Declaration of Independence with everybody has the inalienable right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Um, they link that through three, essentially three components for the individual, uh, compassion, gratitude, and altruism. Um, science shows us and has demonstrated that mindfulness is a path towards compassion. And when we talk about compassion, we define that as doing something when you see somebody hurting, and that starts with the self. And that mindfulness is practice is probably the greatest gift that you can give to yourself um, and to others in doing this work to make the planet a better place and to make yourself and others better for now and for the future. So I'm really very thankful for this, Diana. Um, we will ha be having another webinar, uh, part two on this. We'll let you know when that is. It'll be in two or three weeks. Um, so that, that'll be up on our website at happycounts.org um, slash talks. Um, you can look to it through the webinars link. And thank you to everybody who's attended. Again, if you would like to have uh, the recording of this, I'm going to put my web my name up. And if you didn't get Diana's uh, email, please just email me and I'll make sure that you get connected. And thank you to everybody who attended. And uh, sending the email. So I'm going to unmute everybody so they can say goodbye, um, which makes for a very loud call. <laughs> so I'm unmuting people so you can say goodbye. So goodbye to everybody. Thank you. I'm getting unmuted so you can hear it gets real loud here. So, all right. Thank you to everybody. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Michael. Okay. I'm going to call you in a few minutes. Super. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Laura. Thanks, yeah. Diana. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.
All right. <laughs> you can see if we didn't have it muted how loud it would get. All right. Good night and goodbye. Thank you, everybody.